One of the biggest accusations I've ever had with this podcast is that I'm infamous for stockpiling and recording out of order. Well, anyone who says that we recorded this on March 26th is a fucking liar. <laughs> this is so clearly late April, early May, and the, the reason why me and today's guest, the great Don Tony, know this is because WrestleMania just happened, and Don Tony, what about that mania, huh? I know, right? <laughs> what about that AJ Styles Undertaker match? Unbelievable. Yeah, I can't <laughs> believe that thing happened, but we'll, we'll get to that uh, later on. But of course, as I say, we've got the great uh, Don Tony here, uh, who I uh, can't believe actually has a face, because I became aware of you from TV tracks Yeah. Uh, back in the YouTube days, and now look at you, you're, you're way more handsome. I thought you were going to be a mess. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, you know, because of some health problems, I pretty much got scared sc- straight to really start trying to get my ass in shape and dieting. And I still got a long ways to go. But, you know, over the last year, I probably dropped about 60 pounds. So, you know, there's a few reasons behind it. But hey, I tell you, you know, um, you lose a little bit at a time. And the next thing you know, a month goes by two months, six months. And uh, little pain issues start to go away. You start to feel a little better, even um, when my doorbell rings. Like, I could jump out of bed and just run to the door. And in the past, I'd be like, you know, whoa, you know, things, uh, you know, can't go as fast. So, you know, it's it's a little at a time, but uh, I'm pretty happy so far how things are going. Well, uh, one of the people who isn't happy with how things are going at the minute is... Uh, Vince McMahon. Have you heard of that guy? Yeah, I've heard of him. And uh, he, um, you know, he's a character. But, uh, you know, a lot of people aren't even aware of it yet. It'll become a big news item when one website decides to cover it and then everybody cuts and pastes it. But Vince McMahon, two years from now, there's going to be some big changes in WWE. Um he apparently has some type of a deal set up where he's going to be selling quite a few shares, quite a few shares. Now, he's majority owner of the WWE, but he's got some type of transaction that really does not go to maturity for, for two years, I think, from now. And, um, you know, the look, we don't know exactly what the stock price is going to be tomorrow, but at the time of his agreement for his transaction that just happened very recently, I think he agreed to sell his stock at $38 a share, which actually was a little bit lower than what the price was in the stock market. And you have to do it that way because if you try to sell it at a higher price, I mean, first of all, it can't happen. But the problem is, is that the business world sees Vince selling a crazy amount of stock and sure, I mean, it could be for the XFL for 2021. It could be because he's getting older and need, realizes he needs to start, you know, taking his money and enjoying it or investing it elsewhere. Or he might be trying to um, be ahead of the curve and maybe be concerned that WWE's finances may drop significantly lower. So selling your shares at $38 a share is going to cause people who own the same share to probably get rid of theirs as well. They're a little bit nervous. So I think Vince making this transaction probably hurts WWE. And and unfortunately, a lot of websites out there don't do their own research. So they will ultimately pick up on this story. And then hopefully they understand why things are happening the way that they are. Well, it's just the the reason I ask as well is that it was the, WrestleMania coming up, which I say sarcastically, because obviously we just watched it. But uh, do you think, with obviously with WrestleMania and coronavirus, that WWE were kind of what's what's the well either way they were fucked either way they could cancel the show and then everyone complains and or they go ahead of the show and everyone's complaining. Yeah, they were damned if they do, damned if they don't. I mean, if if they don't do it then it's looked at as a major um, loss as far as finances go. I mean, they lost 
that payday in Florida. Um, at the same time, though, you know, this is an entertainment company that keeps going. My personal opinion, look, at the end of the day, the stock and the finances, their quarterly statements, everything that is on paper is based on revenue and it's based on um, things that happen. And this coronavirus, when there's an investor call, if they would have canceled WrestleMania, you know, the investors would understand that this was a lost opportunity beyond WWE's control. So the idea is, okay, you know, we'll still do it and we're doing it for the fans. And although a lot of people realize that, you know, there's a lot of other entertainers and sports and movies and everything else that want to entertain us right now, but are forced not to because of health risks, wrestling should not be above everyone else. Although as a wrestling fan, I'd rather see some matches happen than none at all. Um, I have said very recently that I thought the idea of pre-recording a lot of WrestleMania matches actually is a positive because they can edit, they could tweak, they could add things, they could take things away rather than doing it live. They could get very, very creative. And my God, I'll use an example since he's fairly new in AEW, Matt Hardy. He did the broken universe in TNA and they had the final deletion. I don't remember any live crowds being in attendance when they were brawling at the Hardy confine and everything else. So the idea that fans have to be there live in order for it to be great is really kind of ignorant when you think about it. Now, wrestling would suck if it never performed in front of crowds or if it was months and months and months. But WWE, say what you want about they're forcing certain people getting pushed over the years and being a little bit tone deaf of what fans really want. But creativity and production wise, you know, they got a pretty good track record. So I'm not as negative on WrestleMania going down this way as many others out there. And if we beat this virus, we get towards the summertime, you have SummerSlam in Boston. That's when they can go part of my French balls out and kind of make up for what went down WrestleMania. Um, so I really don't look at it as much of a negative. Sure, it's not going to be like previous years. There'll always be the asterisk because of the coronavirus. But, you know, as a wrestling fan, I think a lot of people are just looking at the glass half empty instead of it being half full. Is that the right way to say it? Yeah, I think they look. Yeah, I think it's the right way to say it. We we don't have half filled glasses over here. It's all or nothing. Yeah, yeah. You know, but, uh, uh, one of the things that I think would make WrestleMania pretty cool and different this year is, as you said, like with the Hardy compound, they could decorate the room depending on the match. Like with the, the Bray Wyatt one, it could switch between the fun house to the the whatever the fuck the, the other dimension. And the Undertakers could be a graveyard thing. And the Edge Orton one could be all surrounded by uh, ladies' underwear. <laughs> I I think this allows them to be very, very creative. Um, you know, the only thing that people really should be prepared for is some matches, you know, and, and they should have been prepared for it. Some matches will have ridiculous finishes. Some matches will end like this. Some matches, the idea is, all right, we already announced the feud, the storyline, so we kind of have to go through with it. But maybe a month from now, they can perform in front of a live crowd, so we'll give a BS finish. And then we'll see a month from now or a pay-per-view, the next pay-per-view or two pay-per-views down the line. So there's going to be a lot less, uh, there's going to be more unfinished business now uh, than maybe in past WrestleManias. Like the night after WrestleMania was always looked at or mostly looked at as the, the new season. The you know Even though season premieres happen in a different time during the year, but Night after WrestleMania is really like where the new chapter begins. This year, you will have some new chapters, um, but you will also see some chapters that are not fully closed.
And that's, I think, the right way to go. But uh, weirdly, this WrestleMania has been the most uh, must-see for me in years because I have to see what ha- what this is now. Yeah. It's going to be, it's really going to challenge them creatively. Um, look, there's a lot of ways it could go. It could be entertaining, like I said, Final Deletion, or it could end up being something like Randy Orton and Bray Wyatt in that house that they brawled at that time. I mean, you know, that was kind of bad. I mean, you know, there's, it, it, I, I think overall, you know, the wrestlers are pretty damn good performers also. A lot of them, part of my language, a lot of them do have the capability of turning chicken shit into chicken salad. So even though the writing might be a little bit subpar at times, it's the wrestler's job right now to really step it up and take something that may not be the perfect mold and try to get it as perfect as possible. Um, I love the the fact that they can edit and redo something. I know it's, you know, wrestling, when you see it live, you know, you want to see it raw, pun intended, and you want to see it in its original product. But at the end of the day, pro wrestling, for the most part, I mean, across the board, I should say, it's an entertainment. It's a form of entertainment. So, yeah, things are going to be edited. Things will be tweaked. You might have some over-the-top things happening. That's always been in wrestling, so I have no problem with it. I really don't. Well, it's something that I I do have a problem with these days because I work for the the Conan and Disco Inferno podcast, Keeping 100. Uh, They have to deal a lot with AEW fans who just cannot understand or accept the fact that maybe it's just not the greatest thing going. But uh, one of the things that I was found weird that they just refused to accept or understand is that AEW is not all that successful. Like, they're definitely the number two company, but that's because of, by, uh, what's the word, default? By default, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> default. I, I, it sounds so smarter that way. But uh, See, I don't mean to interrupt you, but see, I'm one of the rare people that enjoys both and i will criticize both i burn bridges that way too whatever um a weird thing about a lot of people especially on social media is they want they want to be part of a group and they want everybody feels like their voice has to be heard and if you stay on the sidelines and you don't speak out and you don't get very anime and you don't get very vocal then you're less of a fan or people don't pay attention to you. There's a lot of people online that, again, I don't get it. I, I, I will not accept this, that because someone is a podcaster, um, that they, the reason why they can rip the crap out of AEW or NXT or whatever it is, is because they're a podcaster and they have to cover that. It makes no sense to me because the same people, they don't cover Ring of Honor. They don't cover Impact Wrestling. They don't cover New Japan. They, At the end of the day, they cover what gives them the most attention. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, there is a core group of AEW fans and a core group of WWE fans as well, NXT fans, where, you know, if you dare support both, you're not a true fan of, you have to be one or the other. And at the end of the day, because people want to feel part of a group or part of a clique, you know, part of a movement that, you know, unless you are fully AEW and nothing else, you're not truly part of the movement. And if it does go to another level, you know, I remember ECW, I was a fan of ECW going back to 93, went to a lot of ECW arena shows. I actually did a little work for them the last year and a half pushing tickets and stuff, the original ECW. Um, had some wonderful opportunity. But the thing is, is that when they first announced their pay-per-view, Barely Legal, in 1996, I think, originally was announced. It didn't happen until May of 97 because of everything with New Jack and, you know, uh, Eric Kulis, I think his name was, and whatever. And it got, you know, the cable companies got cold feet. But the one thing is, is that 
I remember this guy by the name of Tony Lewis who had a hotline called Strictly ECW. And he really, really pushed ECW. You had street teams. You had Gabe Sapolsky. You had others who really, Feinstein, who really tried to get ECW on the map. And when they finally got to pay-per-view, that core group of people, you know, were all recognized for it. And they all deserved all the appreciation that they got. And a lot of these fans today, it's like they, instead of just enjoying what they enjoy, that's not enough. They have to feel acknowledged. They have to feel like they're, they're part of the movement and just being a silent fan and just enjoying what you want to watch on TV. It's no, I have to really go off on NXT or I got to really put over AEW is the greatest thing around. AEW is more of a niche. I mean, it's more of a niche. That's the reason why it only gets about seven, eight hundred thousand fans right now. And it's pretty thing that blew me away. And I've been saying this for the last two weeks, especially is you would think with all of the extra wrestling fans forced to stay home on Wednesdays. And even if they were home on Wednesday nights already, there's no sports, there's no baseball, football, soccer, whatever it is. And even with that, the overall ratings are not getting higher. It's not because AEW is worse. It's just because it's it's more of a niche product. You have its core audience. And the one thing AEW's had a difficult time doing is trying to get that additional 10, 20% of fans out there to tune in. Matt Hardy uh, debuts, Brody Lee debuts, and you know the ratings really don't budge. And this is in the middle of coronavirus. So it right now it's more of a niche product. And those over the top people that are just, you know, so like raw with AEW that they they mess, like you said, with Disco and Conan and others, um, you know, because they just got to feel like if AEW does take it to a whole new level, they think that they're the ones responsible and they deserve the accolades and the attention. That's why when somebody gets an AEW tattoo, what's the first thing they do? They not only run to social media to show everyone, but they got to hashtag every single person in AEW because they need that acknowledgement. You know, it's no longer, hey, I'm a fan. I watch. I buy the merchandise. No, I need to be recognized. And that is the biggest problem with a lot of fans of today. Well, one of the things that I think really kills wrestling and like movies, TV and stuff is spoilers. Uh when, when Dave Meltzer, that fucking guy, it gets a spoiler for WWE, he can't wait to print it. Like, ah, oh, uh, Owen Hart's not actually dead. Uh, he's coming back to fucking wrestle Killer Cross, all this shit. Yet with AEW, he clearly is on the inside and isn't giving away any spoilers. Like, we don't know what the next feud is, what the next pay-per-view storyline is, so... Uh, why is it that you think that Dave Meltzer doesn't post a report on AEW spoilers? Um, well, you know, I've said this many times. I'm one of the rare people that supports Meltzer and supports Vince Russo, but I know exactly what you're talking about. And I, even though I'm a supporter of his, I will say it straight up as well. That guy is, he's got a, the Young Bucks have a finishing maneuver. Uh, named after him he has always been a major fan of japanese wrestling he has been a fan of the young bucks omega and others for a very long time and basically a lot of people in wwe especially over the years wcw as well at the time uh they always not everybody but they are but a, a, a large contingency uh always disliked dave Meltzer. You write a newsletter and you could get 90% of the stuff accurately. And I'm not defending him right now, but I'm just making a point. He'll get 90% of the stuff accurate, but the 10% that he may get wrong, that's what they hold on to for years and years and years. You know, just look at the third man for the NWO and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, they, he, that guy, it, 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 when he dies, I think his eulogy will be like the man who claimed viscero. The point is, is that Meltzer does not hide his um, 
fandomhood for J- Japanese wrestling or AEW. And the thing is, is that he's become very biased. He's always been, always had favoritism for Japanese wrestling. That goes back decades, but he is very biased towards AEW. And look, you know, and again, I'm not sticking up for him. I'm just basically trying to explain how I interpret it. And this is just for someone looking outside. I look at Mike Johnson, who's on PW Insider. That guy so badly wanted to be in the back pocket of MLW many, many years ago, or Ring of Honor many, many years ago, that those feds would get front page, first page, would always get crazy amounts of news. And when you had all these other indie feds, because I was involved with some of these indie feds, trying to get just a little bit of publicity, you know, you would get buried, ignored, and this, this, and that. And, you know, you know where your bread is buttered. And for AEW, getting scoops, getting the inside information, getting reports, you know, if you're not in the good graces with them, you know, you're not going to get coverage. So when you have Meltzer, who is got the good graces of AEW, and he is a huge fan of the product, that bias comes out more and more. Um, the thing is, you know, his newsletter, I don't think is as big as what it used to be. I was a subscriber for a very long time, but I think what a lot of people, I, I confuse me is Dave Meltzer. Nobody forces anybody to pay attention to him. Nobody forces anyone to read his newsletter. He wants a rate to match six stars. Why does it anger people so much? You know, if if people out there think that he's ridiculous and, and he's so biased, ignore the guy. You know, I look at the torch. Bruce Mitchell, you know, Wade Keller, I don't pay any mind to them. I, I don't know what they're biased for or not, but they I never liked their work. I have other reasons, too, but I just don't pay attention to them. One thing I'll say about Meltzer is, again, he doesn't hide how his bias, but I don't understand why so many people are so angered with the guy. There are many other people that they could follow in place of him. I personally think when it comes to podcasts and websites, they are just, and again, I'm not defending him. I'm just giving my opinion why I think it is the way it is. Um, I think a lot of people are extremely jealous that there's a wrestling move named after him, that he gets inside info in AEW, that he it just it just comes off as a jealousy because if it wasn't a jealousy, why pay attention to him? Okay, he rated the Young Bucks, Omega, and Page six stars. Um, it was an excellent match. Is it the greatest match of all time? No, but. For him, six stars. Okay, that's his bias coming out. That's him, you know, giving a little extra care for something that he is a huge fan of. There are tons of ECW matches back in the day that are some of my favorite matches of all time, and I've played it to other, for other people, and they said that's garbage. But I was a diehard ECW fan, so I saw it with an extra fondness to it. If people really can't stand Meltzer. Don't pay attention to him. Don't follow him. He wants to rate something six stars. Let him. That's that's how I look at it. I just I, I don't agree with a lot of what he says and he writes. But again, you know, if it really upsets people, just ignore him. I could see if you know if he was, um, you know, like when he charges people for his newsletter, you know what you get. That's why when he has his year-end awards, they just had the awards this year, and Jericho, I think, you know, might have been ranked number one or in something, and you know, you see all of these names that are ranked like one and two, and even I will say, you know, that's ridiculous. But those awards are based on the subscribers, so his subscribers are also in the same boat as him. They feel, have similar views as him, and his newsletter is targeting a certain audience, and that's how he gets his subscriptions. 
people that don't like Meltzer or are not AEW fans probably aren't going to subscribe to Meltzer's newsletter. Well, uh, one of the things that I was excited about getting you on was, uh, and obviously we'll save our WrestleMania review for some other time because it's definitely not March 26th. But uh, I always loved the fact from back in the TV tracks day, sorry, you were very open about your opinions or takes on certain infamous uh, stories. Sure. So I've got I've got some of the classics here that I'd love to talk to you about. Sure. Uh, and plus, due to my uh, contacts and shit, uh, I've heard some shit too about these stories. So uh, I'd love to know your your take or your insight on the Macho Man and Stephanie McMahon rumors, because I, I can tell you from what I was told by someone, uh, Macho Man and Vince got into a fight in a bar once, and Vince lost and had been going, oh, well, he, uh, he cheap shot at me. If, if there was a real fight, a street fight, he, he would have a chance. And he'd been saying this and saying this, and then they fought again in front of people, and apparently Macho Man just kicked the shit out of Vince. And Vince being Vince, he, he could never live it down, all that shit. That then gets spun into these crazy rumors that <laughs> that oh, Macho, Macho, he got the pen, oh, brother. Uh, when she was like 16 fucking years old or whatever. Uh, for me personally, I don't believe that because do you seriously think that Vince would let this giant star go to WCW and not say he fucks kids. Uh, so, <laughs> what what have you heard, and what's your take on the Macho Man and the uh, Stephanie rumors? My opinion on it is this: um, when I those when that rumor first came out decades ago, because I've been watching wrestling since '79. Um, when that rumor first came out, my reaction to it back then is similar to the reaction that I have now. The first thing I thought about is when I was 16 years old. When I was 16 years old, there were certain women in entertainment that I fantasized about. I think we all have done that at some point, when, especially when we were a teenager. And the only scenario that I come up with, and again, this is just my opinion, I'm not trying to claim news, but my interpretation, or my opinion on it is, is that you have a, a 16 year old Stephanie, and she is surrounded by larger than life stars, superheroes, and especially some who might be really genuinely authentic and nice in personal life. And, you know, you get an infatuation, you get a teenage crush. And I always thought that it would, it would not doubt that maybe Stephanie had some teenage crushes of some people in wrestling at the time. And who knows, maybe Stephanie kind of was attracted to Macho Man. I do not think that anything ever happened. I do not think that Macho Man tried to go with a 16-year-old. I think if there's anything at all, to me, the most logical scenario would be the opposite. A 16-year-old girl with a teenage crush. I mean, you see on Twitter now, you look at some teenagers. I mean, I don't search them out, but I have fans of my show and they have friends and fans and some of them are young and you know you you look at roman reigns for example just type in roman reigns on twitter and you'll see tons of 16 year old girls that have reigns in their screen name they'll have lisa reigns or lisa rollins or you know so they have crushes on wrestlers and the if Stephanie had a crush on Macho Man, she had a crush on Macho Man. Um, you know, maybe they had some conversations where Macho Man never looked at it anything other than talking to the boss's daughter. Yeah. And but meanwhile, Stephanie might have. I mean, we when I grew up, there were TV shows where a, a teenage kid would have a crush on an older person and not understand that that's something that could never be. So I think maybe other wrestlers may have seen that and then rumors started to fly that, ooh, 
Maybe something happened between the two. I don't think anything ever happened between the two. And plus, it's been confirmed that there was uh, negotiations for Macho to come back to the WWF in 96, uh, later 96. So uh, that's why I just think it might be a lot of uh, uh, bullshit. Uh, another classic one that I'd love to talk about is uh, Steve Austin and Deborah McMichael, or Deborah Austin, or whatever the fuck. Now, according to her, she said that Austin violently beat her often. But the, the thing about that that I find strange is if he'd have done that at the time, the way she described it, she'd be disfigured. Because like he was on roids. Or sh- I should say he had been really working out a lot by injecting. And uh, I, I, just, I just thought that now maybe he was dick and a bully and aggressive, but I, I think she may have exaggerated the uh, assault claims. Well... See, that's a really hard subject to uh, to talk about. I'll tell you why. All right. You know, I know people who have been physical on their wives or girlfriends. Um, I think, you know, it's I could think of two, two, three people right off the bat. One of my friends in particular, when he used to beat up his girlfriend, um, and you know, I'll use an even better example because some people that follow me already know this story. Uh, when I was in my early twenties, I dated this girl, Susan, and you know, she was hot and you know, people were like, what the hell is she doing with you? And we had a great chemistry and started dating. And after two months like that, it was over. The reason being is because she was abused by boyfriends all her life. I'm not trying to make myself sound like a great person, but I'm not the type to abuse. Um, number one, I always felt no one is worth getting arrested over like that, so I don't abuse. Um, but the thing is, is that she had when we had this talk, and she was telling me about this ex-boyfriend that used to beat the shit out of her all the time, and she showed me a picture of this guy. This guy was like, if you remember Devon Dudley when he was really jacked up in TNA? Yeah. I mean, if you just, instead of him being black, it's an Italian guy. This guy was like this. And this girl, Susan, I dated was probably 110 pounds. This guy with one shot could break her jaw and totally disfigure her also. But he never did. And the thing is, is that... You know, I don't base someone's size or their muscular tone or steroids or not steroids, you know, defining how much abuse they put on someone. Um, I will say this, and this is pretty well known. Um, Steve Austin had dated someone by the name of Tess Broussard. And I don't remember if they were engaged or not, but um, I'm still actually friends with her to this day. And I have talked, I haven't talked to her recently, but we used to have a lot of conversations off of the show. And I had interviewed her probably, my God, it must have been about 15 years ago, 12 years ago. And she made some really outrageous claims towards Steve Austin. And believe it or not, about two years ago, some website out there that was trying to rehash like old stuff to try to clickbait. They brought up how Vince talked about something like with his cousin or something like that. And it was a Playboy interview from like 2001. They were trying to report it as news right now. But the thing with Tess Broussard is she made some pretty wild accusations against Steve Austin. And because I was friendly with her also, you know, when I did the interview with her, you know, I basically talked not as an interviewer, but as a guy, like, what she was claiming to me that he did, you know, I was like, wow, what a piece of shit. And to this day, I'm blocked from Steve Austin on social media because I was friends with her and because that type of interview. And over the years, like, I will never know if it was true or not. I'll never know if she exaggerated or not. Um, but you know, it's nothing personal against the guy. I see him now and I just can't envision him being an abuser like that. But, you know, just like this Benoit documentary that came out, you know, 
at the end of the day, the only people that will ever know why Chris Benoit did what he did is Chris Benoit and God. And the only people that will ever know the truth as far as what Steve Austin did with Deborah is Steve Austin and Deborah. So, you know, I, I just, you you never know, you never know. And, um, it just, it sucks to be in a position like that of abuse. And I have had some people over the years that came off as the nicest people in the world who we found out were abusers. I'm not talking about anybody in wrestling. I'm just talking in private life. And some people that you would never ever in a million years could hurt a fly, you find out, has been just doing just crazy abuse on people. And it's not always just physical, it's mental as well. So I honestly don't know as far as what he did and didn't do. Um, you know, I I just, you know, it's it's a bad situation to be in. It really is. But I will say this. We have heard zero about Steve Austin and abuse forever so if, if there was issues at the time um give the man credit that there have been no issues i haven't heard one iota of anything like that for god what is it it's got to be 15 16 years 2002 yeah when i interviewed i think it was 2003 or 2004 so it's been about 15 years i haven't heard anything negative about steve austin since so look you know, people do make mistakes in their life and they learn from them. And in the case of Steve Austin, maybe he did abuse at the time. Maybe he, it was exaggerated, but even if it did happen at that time, I always feel that people can grow and redeem themselves and improve. And the guy has done nothing negative in my opinion in the last 15 years of anything with abuse. So I have to go with what you know, I, I see, I don't know him personally, but, you know, at the time it felt a little bit overblown. It felt a little bit exaggerated. And I agree with you. You, know, you could just knock her out, you know, broke all the teeth in one shot, you know, but, you know, once I became friendly with Tess and, uh, you know, and she started saying some of the things, then you start thinking, hey, maybe it is true, but I give the guy credit for, you know, really no signs of anything like that in well over a decade. So, well, uh, one of the benefits of this coronavirus thing for me is that I'm getting to spend a lot more time in the house. Uh, only problem is my lunch breaks are now four to five hours long instead of the 30 I usually <laughs> get. Uh, I've been binging a lot of older WC or later WCW stuff that I missed out on. Uh, I've I've really become a total mark for Scott Steiner. I think it was during 2000, he was maybe one of the best in the world. Uh, but the, the big match <clears throat> that WCW never gave us was Scott Steiner versus Hulk Hogan. <clears throat> so uh, have you ever had heard any stories of why that feud never happened? Because just to be a, a, a dick, I don't know why I called myself that. Uh, I personally, at a meet and greet, witnessed uh, Scott Steiner talk about how Russo was going to do a storyline with them that was going to last four pay-per-views. And then, literally within 15 minutes before going on air, the whole thing was dropped. Uh, so uh, that's what he said. It might be a load of shit. But uh, I was wondering, have you ever heard any rumors or theories as to why Steiner versus Hogan never happened? Well, I think timing had a lot to do with it as well. When Hogan turned heel and joined the NWO in 1996, um, you know, Scott Steiner was still Steiner Brothers, still babyface. And you had Steiners feuding a little bit with Hall and Nash. But, you know, Hogan was always the main eventer and always, you know, the, the big guy, the focal point, Scott Steiner was always tag team wrestler. It was only when he started, you know, changing his look. And, and I, when I was doing my history shows and I stopped him about two years ago, I always talked about the time that Scott Steiner technically turned heel, but didn't turn heel. And it was several years before he ever, you know, the full blown heel 
I, I don't remember if the match was against Ricky Steamboat or someone, but you know, they teased him turning heel and it was very interesting at the time, but Scott Steiner, you know, when you think of, you know, Michigan and, you know, him with his brother, he was just such like a, a, a you know, not a clear cut baby face because when he had that brief cup of tea in ECW, you know, he had a little bit of an attitude with him, but you know, wasn't just like a, like an anger, but when he turned heel and then bl- dyed his hair and then became the big bad booty daddy, you know, at the same time, Hogan was also a heel. And, you know, I'm assuming when you're talking about what Vince Russo wanted to do, this was right around the time with the new blood and the problem with, with the new blood. And, and it was like the millionaires club is, is that technically Hogan and Scott Steiner would have been really on the, on the same side and Hogan, you know, when they brought the, the red and yellow back, it was a very short time later that he had the incident at Bash at the Beach with Vince Russo and walked out. So I think early on, I think it was just more that Hulk Hogan was main eventing, Scott Steiner was tag team. When he became Big Bad Booty Daddy, you know, you technically they were heels at the same time and they never really crossed paths. And I, I've been doing my I, I started doing my wrestling hotline in 97 and I covered this time period as well. I don't really remember too many times where there were reports that Steiner and Hogan were going to have a program. I do believe that Vince Russo uh, thought about it and thought it would be a, a great idea. The problem is, how do you get from A to D? You know, because at that time, when you think of who Hogan was feuding with, with Nash, and then, you know, then they were together, and then they were apart, and then you had Jeff Jarrett in the mix, and it was like you had to go through so many steps, and then you had Sting into the equation, and Luger, and others, there was never a focus on Steiner and Hogan, and, you know, it's, I think it was just, if, if Hogan didn't have the incident with Vince Russo, I think that could have happened. I think that down the line would have happened. I just don't remember them crossing paths all that much. Just like when Brett and Hogan were in WWF at the time, there were a lot of us that wanted to see Brett versus Hogan. You know, we got a you know a diversion and Yokozuna got into it. And then we learned later on as far as why that that didn't go down. But that was still when you look back on it, it was such a short period of time. So you know they gave us the aura. Once Brett went to WCW, that Brett versus Hogan is something that people wanted for years, and Hogan wouldn't let it happen, and this, this and that. Eh, that's not necessarily true because when Brett finally started branching out, where people thought he could be a world heavyweight champion, you're talking 1992, maybe 93, and at that time, that's when Hogan pretty much was, you know, starting to go on his way out. Then we had the steroid scandal. And then he joined WCW. So, you know, you, you, people need, when they t- look back on that, they got to look at the time frame. And when you realize that it's so small and there was so much pressure because of the attitude here with WWF and them really getting momentum, you know, to get from here to here by having Hogan versus Steiner, that's not something that many people talked about at the time. Uh, well, just as we're wrapping up, we're coming up to the final three topics here. When I when I first started this podcast, I was emailing everyone. I had like fucking maybe eight, twelve listeners. I had like a hundred subscribers on YouTube. Uh, Bruce Pritchard was one of the first people that said yes, which I couldn't believe or understand why he did it. Uh, in the process of doing that interview, I, I asked him about the infamous WrestleMania Nine rumors about the the, the original planned card. He said no, that that wasn't true. Then on the WrestleMania 9 episode of his own show, he said, oh, a lot of those were true. And I was like, what the fuck? And even recently on his podcast, he's contradicting stuff that he said about the same subject on separate episodes. One in particular, give one example. Uh, From WrestleMania 9? Yeah. Well, he, I had heard that the original plan 
<clears throat> was to do the uh, real American hero gimmick with Scott Steiner. And Scott Steiner was supposed to win the Royal Rumble to wrestle Bret Hart. And, and he told me, he goes, no, that, that wasn't the plan. That wasn't the plan at all. But then on the show, on, on something to wrestle with, he said exactly that. And it's like, you fucking liar. Who'd you like? <laughs> so uh, the, the question I've got for you is Bruce Pritchard, while I'm very grateful for the interview, uh, is he full of shit? I'll be honest with you. I am a huge Bruce Pritchard fan. But even with that said, um, you know, look, I don't have many connections in wrestling. I have a few friends over the years, some people that I would never make public, you know, I cherish their friendships. And although tempting sometimes to just throw it in people's faces, I keep it private and always will. Um, But I'll say this. One thing that I have learned over the years, whether it's Pritchard or Bischoff or even Vince Russo, Vince Russo, um, I'm a subscriber of all his stuff. I've been a fan of his since day one. I've never left that bandwagon. Um, You know, Conan, I mean, people already know my history with him, with there, not going to bring that up. My point is, is that if you listen to all of these guys enough over the years, one one day they'll tell you the sky is blue, and then down the line they'll say the sky is actually gray. And in wrestling, there's always discussions about, hey, what do you think about this? Hey, let's try this. Or, hey, what about this? Or, hey, could you think of this? And, um, you know, not not all of it ever comes to fruition. I think the problem is, is, you know, there's so many things discussed that as far as Steiner and Bret Hart with the Royal Rumble, I don't ever recall ever hearing those rumblings. I don't even remember ever even reading something like that in Meltzer's newsletter at the time. But that could have been something discussed and then quickly shot down. So... You know, maybe, and you got to understand something too. Over the years, and I'm not defending these guys, but over the years, you do forget things from here. Here, so at the time, because Steiner and Bret Hart never really was something serious, he probably was telling you the truth when he said, "Nah, it was never in the plans." But then later on, maybe he recalls a conversation with somebody in creative about, you know, hey, what, what about the idea of having Steiner win this? I don't ever recall Scott Steiner, and I was a WWF fan at the time. I don't ever recall Scott Steiner ever getting any type of momentum where he could possibly win the Royal Rumble. Even when me and my friends would just, you know, talk to each other and say, who do you think is going to win? Who's that? I don't ever recall anybody ever saying, you know, Scott Stein, he's on that momentum. That guy, he, you know, he could win the run. It just was never in the card. So I think sometimes they immediately don't remember something and then it'll hit them. Um, but I also think, too, that because Vince and Jim Ross and others never come out publicly and say, that's not true. That's not true. You're full of shit. This is and that. I think. You know, if sometimes they will twist and change and this and that, especially years later, if an, if an idea sounds like it would have been wonderful, you know, somebody may years later say, yeah, you know, we actually thought about doing that. And that's simply because you got a whole bunch of people who are listening or watching your show. Not you, I'm saying, but them. And they're like, oh, my God, that was so smart. Oh, could you imagine what that would have been? And that just sparks a whole new discussion and conversation. Meanwhile, they're talking right out of their ass. Um, a lot of stuff that is said and, and it becomes urban legend. A lot of stuff people talk out of their ass. Unfortunately, it happens more and more when people are deceased. Because unfortunately, the dead cannot come back to life to tell, say that somebody's full of shit. But anybody who is exaggerated like that, none of them do it with any type of malice. It's just, why didn't I think it out at the time? Holy shit, what a great fucking idea. Oh, I know. I could say, hey, you know, hey, I actually, we were discussing that at the time. But, you know, hey, it just didn't work out the way it did. Or Vince, you know, 
and then they realize, you know, it never happened. It it so these guys do talk out of their ass. Um, it is what it is. You know, you can't, you know, take everything as gospel. But um, you know, you could you could tell if you listen to people long enough, you could tell when people start twisting and churning. And you saw that with Bruce Pritchard, but. I'm still a big fan of his, but yeah, I know I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, he'll say something, and three years later, it's t- totally the opposite. Well, then a, a similar sort of question is I've got to ask you about Jim Cornette. Now, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the DM or the screenshot that the Young Bucks had uh, where he had literally DM'd him saying, hey, come on, let, let's try and get a storyline going or something like that, maybe a little deeper voiced. But uh, my whole thing is, is Jim Cornette full of shit? Like, is he he to be taken seriously when he, because it really seems to me that if something's popular, he thinks it sucks. Like if, if, like at WrestleMania, the match that tore the house down was uh, Lashley versus Aleister Black. And I'm sure you'd love to talk about that match, but this isn't March 26th. You know, it's in the past. But uh, if that's this like ten star classic, Cornette's going to hit it. Uh, so it, uh, the question that I'd say again is: uh, Is Jim Cornette someone that should be taken seriously? Well, you know, look, um, there were many years that I was I thought Jim Cornette was just totally off his rocker. As years have gone by, I have understood him more and more. Jim Cornette, I honestly don't think has any, you know, malice in his bo- in his body, in his heart. But he is extremely old school and is one of those guys that really um you know, just looks at wrestling in the same glasses that he did 15 years ago. And I don't think that'll ever change. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, there there are forms of wrestling right now that some people find entertaining. I mean, you see some of the now with the coronavirus, this there's a match online where the two guys are not even touching each other. And because of, you know, the social distancing, they did this in the ring. Now, me, I think it's asinine and stupid. I, it's not killing the business because we know that everything is entertainment and predetermined and it's an art form. But when people do that, it's like spitting in the face. I'll give you a good example of it. Um, magicians. I don't remember who the magician was, but I remember many years ago on TV, they were hyping up a special all the magic tricks were going to be revealed and some asshole showed up on you know us tv and basically revealed all of the the magic tricks now me yeah i could go on youtube and figure out how a trick is done and you know whatever but when someone goes out there and purposely tries to let the cat out of the bag i think that's disrespectful to the art of magic when you have Uh, Many years ago, there was some series on some cable channels. I know a lot of people that are watching will remember this, where it was all the secrets of wrestling revealed. And it's this and that. And, you know, you had this person whose voice was scrambled and didn't want to reveal himself. And, you know, to me, it's like it's big F you to wrestling. So I understand why Jim Cornette wants to keep, you know, the wrestling pure and Uh, an art form and suspension of disbelief. The problem is, is that Jim Cornette needs to understand that we're in a society now where it has evolved and things have changed. And, you know, you, I'm not a fan of Joey Ryan with the dick flip. I think it's one of the most ridiculously stupid things. I mean, I thought when Papa Shango, you know, made ultimate warrior throw up, I thought it was goofy. You know, this stuff is just, I can't get, wrestling should always be suspension of disbelief. Just like when you go into a movie theater with the, see a horror film. From beginning of the movie to the end of the movie, you have that suspension of disbelief of what you're seeing is real. You don't have during the movie, you know, uh, 
Jason, a half a block away, go like this. And then somebody goes like that and their head split open. You know, when the cameras are rolling, you're supposed to have suspension of disbelief from beginning to end. So that's why I agree with Jim Cornette. The problem is, is that he will never win the fight of the, the evolving of wrestling in some forms. And unfortunately, he learned the hard way with NWA. And look, I have moved on as far as Dave Lagan. I am a huge fan of NWA right now. I plug it everywhere I can. People have been telling me, please do the, you know, the the, you know, the episodes they do with the, you know, the podcast. So, but the point is, is that when Cornette said what he said using the Ethiopia joke, on one of my shows, I played five different times that Cornette had said that over the years. And the thing is, is that in Cornette's heart, it was not racist. It was not, it was just a bad joke that is outdated and stupid. But when you are, when the cameras are rolling, Jim Cornette, his mind goes old school. So you think of jokes, you think of one-liners, you think of things that worked in the past. And I'll be quick with this, but when he talked about Trevor Murdoch and he talks about having a bucket of fried chicken and this and that, in 2020, 2019, people will think that is the most offensive thing out there, even though in Jim Cornette's heart, it's not meant that way. It's meant that he's such a tough guy that if he went through Ethiopia, you know, and there's people are starving and need food and this is and that. You know, if you want to use it now, if Jim Cornette was still doing, doing commentary, he could say Trevor Murdoch is so tough that he could ride around the streets of New York City with a gallon of hand sanitizer on his back. And, da, 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 da. and it would have had the same result. That's not race, but it's interpreted that way. And the problem why I brought up NWA is, is that for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, whoever produces the TV, whoever puts the episodes online, you know, Dave Lagana and others, they heard it. They saw what Jim Cornette said, and it made past all of these people. And when people got really upset about it online, you know, in my opinion, NWA threw Jim Cornette under the bus. Instead of taking a little bit of responsibility as well and saying, look, you know, Jim, you know, it's an outdated joke. It wasn't meant to be racist, this and that. You know, they just like really distanced themselves. So Jim Cornette has a lot of bitterness for what's going on today. I have a lot of bitterness for what's going on today. Joey Styles is a perfect example. It pisses me off to this day that Joey Styles is not on AEW or some type of wrestling promotion on TV, that guy is an awesome commentator. And because he made a dumb joke at the time, because it, it, that was the controversy with Trump saying you grabbed him by the pussy, Joey Styles doesn't have an ounce of hatred towards women in his body. He's pretty much been banned by wrestling. And it's not because the wrestling community is so in an uproar over Joey Styles. It's just that people out there are so afraid to speak out for themselves that if one promotion comes up and says, we're going to bring Joey Styles in, they're afraid that all of these people on social media put this company out of business, put this out of business. So Jim Cornette has a lot of animosity because of what is wrestling in some ways have become today. But the thing is, is that he'll never win that argument. And I don't I don't think deep down inside he, you know, has any, you know, bitter hatred. But, you know, you look at him as well. I don't I'm not trying to insinuate this. Jim Cornette comes off like a guy that could be easily you probably, you know, could easily get beat up. I don't know if Jim Cornette could defend himself in a fight. No one out there is going to physically hit him. But I think that defense shield comes up so bad with him and it's such a target on his back that it, he is very bitter and very angry. Um, and that's where Jim Cornette gets it wrong a lot of times, because like you said, you could have a particular match that really deserves to be appreciated. And in some ways, simply because of who's involved in the match, it gets ripped apart. You know, I have defended Joey Janela sometimes 
Um, I understand why Jim Cornette calls him Joey Nutella and this, this and that, but Joey Janela actually does pretty good sometimes. And, you know, still he will go out of his way to always criticize something. That's his right. I don't agree with Jim Cornette a lot, but I see you cannot win some of the arguments today. You just can't. So I don't, I, I think everybody in wrestling bullshits to a certain extent and exaggerates. It's the entertainment business. It happens in, you know, non-wrestling entertainment. It's just, you know, people, you know, this is the way it's always been and it's the way it always will be. Jim Cornette is old school. He will always be old school. And um, that unfortunately gets him in trouble sometimes. Well, uh, just as we come to the final question, and this is a genuine question, and I say this to people a lot, and they think I'm fucking ridiculous, but I'm very serious. Uh, as I've mentioned, I, I work for Disco Inferno, and, and I just, you know, your ep- the, the episode I did with him will be out the week before this. Uh, but I'm a big it, fan of Vince, of uh, Vince. I'm a big fan of Disco Inferno, by the way. Me growing up, I was always into disco. So when he was doing the Disco Inferno, I, I loved it. Always enjoyed his, his, his character. And uh, he says a lot of things about today's society that I agree with him 1000% on, by the way. I just had to say that. Yeah, but that, that's actually the question I was going to ask is, um, do you think he is a widely, widely underrated talent? Well, you know, look, I don't want to put him in the same category as, um, uh, what was his name? Um, the guy that did the Mortal Kombat, uh, Glacier, okay? Yeah. I mean, you go on social media, especially YouTube. And whenever you look at the worst gimmicks of all time, like they always put Glacier near the top of the list. Disco Inferno's on some of those lists too, but they always put Glacier on that list. Now, I remember in the mid 90s when Glacier is, was coming and we were like shortly after Mortal Kombat and all this other stuff. I could tell you 1000% clarity. Um, Glacier was not like, the worst thing ever at the time. Um, was he like a big superstar? I mean, it was hyped up that way, but Glacier was not, you know, the, the, um, uh, he was not like the second coming of the gobbledygooker. All right. So Glacier over years, people realized it was popular to just diss the guy and shit on him and this, this and that, and he gets ripped apart. And it's, I think it's so unfair. Disco Inferno, when you go back at that time, Disco Inferno, what is gimmick? It was like a John Travolta ripoff. Um, I, I love it. Disco Fever. Yeah, yeah. I love the character. And there are plenty of comments of me online always defending it. Um, Disco Inferno was on the level of like Alex Wright and others at the time. Uh, wasn't going to be in the, you know, in the uh, main event or semi main event, but, and that was, that was fine. Not everybody, you know, has to today's day and age, you know, everybody gets a trophy. Everybody gets an opportunity. It's my, I mean, I don't want to name any particular names, Dana Brooke, but um, you know, you, you, Oh, it's my time. It's me. I, I earned this. It's my time. It's my time. It's my time. You get no fucking reaction after a couple of years, you may be a nice person and you may have some ability, but unfortunately you never made that connection. And no, you may think it's your time, but it's not your time. Um, at that time, you know, it, it was never Disco Inferno's time to be a main eventer. He was part of the NWO for a little while, but he knew his role and he did a great job with it. And his role was never to have five-star matches. His role early on was to be, you know, an annoying Disco John Travolta, who's doing his moves and this, this, and that, and, you know, and, but have some in-ring ability. And there was nothing wrong with that. In today's day and age, if Disco Inferno was around now at 25 years old, you know, he would get buried. You know, at that time, it, it was tolerated. And, you know, I always liked the character. It was meant to be annoying. Um, when he teamed up with Alex Wright, it was actually a lot of fun, but you know, even now when he does some appearances in impact wrestling or, or other work that he does, 
you know, it's not overly done and the guy could still go. The guy is very outspoken with his views about the world. And I will always give him a hell of a lot of credit for speaking his mind. I mean, some of his opinions, we won't get into them now, but some of his opinions are very unpopular, you know, but he speaks his mind and he sticks to it. And, you know, you got to respect that. So I always, I was always a fan of the character. Hell, the reason why I have some of this stuff the way it is, is because, you know, growing up, you know, I was always into dance music and disco and house music and techno and stuff like that. So it kind of reflects on me a little bit to this day. But unfortunately, people just overanalyze everything on social media because, again, you know, everybody needs to be heard. Everybody has this almost heroin obsession of getting recognized. That's why there are 50,000 top 10 lists of people who weren't even, uh, you know, even sperm eggs at the time. You know, no, you did not, you were not a wrestling fan or even alive during the mid 90s. So you don't understand this person or this character or this is that. You look back on it and think it's god awful. I'll never forget. When I first started getting into going, branching over from hotlines to podcasting in like, oh, four, I think it was this one guy who is a very young wrestling fan was on an episode with me once. And this guy was trying to explain to everyone how Andre the Giant was one of the worst wrestlers that in, in wrestling history and bringing up the his work rate in WrestleMania three. And, 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 you know, and the point is, is that you see people today that weren't alive at that time don't understand how important the storylines were and Andre's career before he, you know, physically couldn't do it anymore. But they look at this and they will judge everything on this. And unfortunately, Disco Inferno over the years got a, you know, got always thrown into this, you know, one of the worst gimmicks of all time. No, it wasn't. There was nothing wrong with that character. Nothing wrong with it whatsoever. I was a well, fan of it. Well, uh, coronavirus may be cured, but we're never going to get rid of disco fever. That's the main thing. Uh, but listen, Don Tony, this has been amazing. Uh, is there uh, just before we say goodbye? Is there any uh, plugs you'd like to give out? Well, I got DonTony.com, and um, you know, I go. I started doing my wrestling hotline in 1997, and after 22 years of doing just audio only work. Um, I started doing video it's about a little over two months ago and it just absolutely love it. Go to my YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash Don Tony. Grab that name many, many years ago, not realizing that it would be really catchy now. And, uh, I thank you for the privilege of being on here. We definitely need to do this again. And I will say this too, you know, I did go through a lot of your previous episodes to get familiar with it. And uh, I love how you incorporate a lot of music into your shows. And uh, the ELO episode, I enjoyed tremendously. Yeah. I was a fan of the Electric Light or Orchestra. Yeah, well, I was meant to be going to see them soon, but this fucking disco fever is taking over. <laughs> Listen, uh, I just want to uh, thank you so much. And uh, you. stay safe and stay indoors to wash your hands. Yes, yeah. Lysol. Even nobody here, I still, after we're done, sanitize, sanitize, sanitize. 